Uh, but he uh, came by this afternoon and said he wanted uh, to express his appreciation to all of you who support the benevolent work. He was able to do a lot this week and today in particular, and so he's appreciative of that. Uh, we'd ask, uh, if you don't mind, Brother Steve McGregor will open us up with a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Amen. Mention those who had had uh, procedures. Uh, Wade came through well yesterday. Uh, word was he was moved to a regular room today, and so he's uh, improving. Uh, Joey came out of his procedure today well. He is home resting now, and so uh, that's good news on both of those fronts. You can open your Bibles this evening to Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah is being given several visions in a row to uh, conjure for him and for his readers uh, at the specific time that he was prophesying and for us by extension, uh, the message that God wanted to send. And the message in chapter 4 is directed primarily to Zerubbabel and Joshua, to the leaders, encouraging them, uh, giving them confidence in the work that they've been uh, asked to do, which is rebuilding uh, the city, uh, rebuilding the temple, and so forth. And uh, you remember we began in, in Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 1, And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep, and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and as seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof. You drop down to verse 12, and you see a further description. And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And we showed this diagram, which is sort of a graphic representation of uh, basically what Zechariah would have seen. Uh, he would have seen two olive branches which would have fed a continuous stream of olive oil into two pipes, which then filled a larger container and then had from that smaller vessels which fed each individual candlestick. And so what you have here is a continual uh, supply of oil for these lamps. And uh, that's the, the visual representation of what Zechariah would have seen. Now, we asked the question in the invitation last Wednesday evening. Zechariah continues to ask. He asks on two occasions, and then the third time, we see there in verse number 12, he repeated a question and rephrased it. He's asking essentially, what's going on here? What are these things? And he is repeatedly met with the interrogation of the angel, Know you not what these things be. And we see that in Zechariah 4 and verse number 3, or verse number 4, What are these, my Lord? In verse 5, The angel that talked with me answered and said unto him, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. 
And so we mentioned that exchange between Zechariah and the angel. What are these? Don't you know? No, I don't. Why would the angel put Zechariah through those paces each time he asked that question? The only conclusion that I can reach is that the angel is trying to sort of reinforce for Zechariah that Zechariah is going to have to use his brain. He's going to have to, to put on his deductive reasoning cap and he's going to have to do uh, some logical reasoning about the things that God has given him. And we understand, and we mentioned this in the invitation, that you and I have to do the same thing. How amazing is it that God has so structured the, His Word that it is at the same time easily accessible and as challenging as we could ever want it to be. It's both of those things. Do you know how difficult that is to do? Um, uh, how many of you just enjoy leisure reading? You read novels regularly. Are most of those novels deep and uh, you know, deal with major literary issues? Uh, they are? Okay, well that's good. A lot of the, the fiction that people who regularly read, a lot of what it is, it's sort of like pulp type fiction. It's just sort of popular fiction, you know, and, and you can see the story coming from a mile away. The characters are sort of, sort of uh, watercolor characters, and that's okay, right? It's just it's, it's shallow surface reading and it's entertainment. But then there is deeper literature, which is what, what I enjoy reading some as well. And generally, you can't have a book that is both. It can't be both enjoyable on a shallow elementary level and be deep and meaningful. But the Word of God is both. If you want to go to the Word of God and you want to just mine out of it what you need in order to be saved, you can absolutely do that. But if you want to exhaustively study it every day of your life and have it challenge you, every single time you open its pages, it can do that too. And the Word of God is so amazing because it is inexhaustible, the things that you can get from it. As a preacher, every time I re-examine a passage, I find a different way to approach it. I find something in it that I didn't recognize, that I didn't realize the first time. Um, of course, there are also those times when I I sit down and I'm outlining a passage and I think, wow, that's really neat what I did. And I look back through my notes and I did that exact outline 10 years ago. So, you know, your brain also kind of jumps into its own pathways that it, that it makes. But the Word of God is inexhaustible. And I think one of the things that the angel is trying to communicate to Zechariah is, Zechariah, you've got to put your brain in gear. You've got to use the deductive reasoning and the common sense and the logic that God gave you to examine these things and break them down and consider them. I'm not just going to spoon feed you. And again, as we noticed in the, in the invitation last Wednesday, it's the same thing Jesus said to His disciples when they questioned the parables. Do you not understand these parables? How will you understand anything if you don't understand these? And so uh, the, the challenge is before us to dig deeply and to find an understanding. It is not a good enough excuse to say, well, I don't understand what God wants me to do. We can and we must understand. And I think that's one of the, the, the subtexts here in, in Zechariah chapter 4. This, this back and forth between the angel and Zechariah is underscoring for us, we're going to have to put forth the effort. We're going to have to study. We're going to have to dig deep. And uh, if we do, we will be rewarded with an understanding that God desires us to have. So we see that. Now, the message overall that God is giving to Zechariah is very interesting as well. We see the vision of this, these olive trees and the, the pipes and the bowls and the lamps, and we see all of that, but there's a, a greater message that's trying to be presented. And what we're going to talk about for the remainder of chapter 4 before we move into chapter 5 is the significance of this message. Let's get to... Verse 6, here's the angel's response to Zechariah's first question. What is it? In verse 6, then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, This is the message I want you to send to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. So his point, his very first point is, 
whatever victory Zerubbabel is going to achieve, whatever success he's going to have, whose success will it be? Where will that success come from? God. It's not going to be Zerubbabel because you're some great person. It's not going to be because of any physical, personal prowess that you have. It will be all because of God. Now, is that an encouraging thing? Absolutely. Zerubbabel, you don't have to be the strongest person in the room at all times. You don't have to be the most capable person who's ever lived. You just have to do what I say. And if you do what I say, you will be successful. That's a comforting thought. Now, for some of us, it's hard to put our pride aside and say, I don't have to be the best. I don't have to be the strongest. I don't have to be the most capable. All I have to do is trust God. Because we want to be the best. We want to be the strongest. We want to be the most capable. I don't have to be a perfect parent. I just have to do what God says. I don't have to be a perfect husband. I just have to do what God says. And that, that is encouraging. Because if perfection is my goal, then I'm in trouble. Um, but if following God is my goal, then that, that adjusts expectations. And so that's exactly what God is doing here, saying, look, whatever victory you have, whatever success you have, it's not going to be because of you anyway. So stop worrying about whether you're good enough. And just do what I tell you to do. And that's, that's the message there. He continues uh, in verse 7, and we'll get to that in just a moment. We see examples of this all throughout the Old and New Testaments. In Joshua chapter 6, Joshua got an army together and they went against the city of Jericho, this heavily defensed, walled city. And there was a great plan that was undertaken. What was that plan? March around the city, okay, for six days. For so many times a day. Then on the seventh day, you're going to march around the city. Then you're going to make a loud blast with a ram's horn. And then what's going to happen? Walls are going to fall down flat. Does that sound like a good military plan to you? March, 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 and then blow your trumpets. I mean, you know, the greatest military minds of our age haven't reused that same plan, I don't think. In World War II, that's not what we did, right? Um, why was that the plan? So God's going to be the one that does this. You're just going to do whatever I tell you to do, and if you do what I tell you to do, the walls will just fall down and you don't have to do anything. Not by your might, not by your power, but by my spirit. That was the message in Joshua 6. What about in Judges chapter 7? In Judges chapter 6, we're introduced to Gideon. He's hiding behind a wine press. And the angel of the Lord calls him a mighty man of valor while he's hiding behind the wine press. And Gideon asks for a sign, and then he asks for another sign, and God gives him the sign. And then we get to Josh, Judges chapter 7. And I want you to look, uh, somebody read verse 2 of Judges chapter 7. Has any captain, any general ever said, we have too many soldiers? We've got too many guns, too many bombs, too many planes, too many aircraft carriers. No, you just want more, 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 right? Because if you have a larger army, the chances are better you're going to defeat your enemy. But God said, the people that are with you are too many. Why? Lest Israel vaunteth itself up. So God whittled it down to how many people? 300. First he said, if you're afraid, go home. And then he said, well, if you lap a certain way, go home. And Gideon was left with 300 people. So that God could prove that he was the, what, the, the reason that, that the victory was going to happen. That it didn't have anything to do with these people. It had to do with God. And over and over and over again, God's message is, not by your might, not by your power, but by my Spirit. And that's the message repeatedly. Well, we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And Paul gets on the topic of his thorn in the flesh. What is Paul's thorn in the flesh? 
You don't know. That's no fun. What is Paul's thorn in the flesh? Well, is it his eyesight? I don't know. Is it something else? I don't know. Uh, the, the, to me, the most uh, uh, convincing speculation I've heard is that Paul struggled with eyesight from the road to Damascus on throughout his life. And that that was, that was a, a physical impairment that he dealt with. And it got worse over time. And I can imagine someone as bullheaded and independent as Paul struggling with that. Because there's very little that can challenge your independence more than not being able to see. I can imagine that would hinder your independence to a great level. So if that's the case, it makes sense. I can't prove that. I'm certainly not dogmatic about it. Whatever it is, I want you to look at 2 Corinthians 12 in verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. The messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So he, whatever the thorn in the flesh is, he tells us what its purpose is. What is it? To keep him humble. Yes. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient thee. And then here's the statement. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Verse 10. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, what? then am I strong. Why? Because I learn humility and I realize, after all, it's not about my power anyway. It's about the power of God. And that's the message that Paul had to learn. I th and did he have to learn that? Well, he tells us in Philippians 4, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. That's not something that was innate in Paul. Paul was stubborn, independent, and driven not the qualities that lend well to humility. But Paul had to learn that. Yes, sir? That's right. There, there were certainly some things he couldn't do, but in the context of overcoming and spiritually being victorious... He could do all things through Christ. You mean that verse isn't about athletic competition? All these folks have quoted Philippians chapter 4 in reference to... <laughs> it is often misapplied. Yes, yes. Um, so, the first significant thing that God is trying to communicate to Zerubbabel is, look Zerubbabel, it's not about you. Don't worry about whether you're strong enough or good enough. My strength is going to be what causes this, this to happen anyway. Okay, connected to that is verse 7. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 7. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. So this message, this uh, significant message, an important detail, is connected to the first one. This message, again, is primarily for Zerubbabel. His name wasn't mentioned in verse 6, but in verse 7 we learn that it is all, or it is mentioned in verse 6, but it's specifically focused on him in verse 7. Look, whatever Zerubbabel wants to do or sets his mind to do, he'll be successful in. But not because of him, but because of me. And it's interesting the wording that's used. What art, who art thou, O great mountain? There's no mountain that Zerubbabel will not be able to move. Now, does that sound familiar? Go to the New Testament. And twice in Matthew's account, Jesus gives a similar statement to his disciples. You remember the first one in Matthew 17? Do what? That's right. And he, he says this on a number of occasions to them. In Matthew 17 and verse 20, uh, they were attempting to cast out a demon and could not. And they said, why could we not cast him out? Verse 19, and Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, Matthew 17, 20, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, 
Remove hence unto yonder place, and it, shall be, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. He uses similar language to what God tells Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, there's no mountain that can stand before you. That's the same thing that Jesus said to His disciples. If you truly had faith, then you could harness the power that I've given you by inspiration, and you could have accomplished anything. In Matthew 21, He says the same thing in verse 21. Verily I say unto you, if you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done, that is, kill the fig tree, but also if you shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. Faith to move mountains. And God tells Zerubbabel that he will be able to defeat anything that stands in his path. Because it's not about his power, it's about the power of God. And that's the point that God is trying to communicate to Zerubbabel Now, he's also communicating this to Joshua. How do I know that? Look at verse 14. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of all the earth. The question is, what are these two olive branches? And God said, These are the two anointed ones. I believe we we brushed upon this last Wednesday night. Only two uh, offices were anointed in the Old Testament. They were... King and priest. Well, the king right here is Zerubbabel. He's the governor. And the priest is Joshua. And so the two anointed ones are the ones who will keep these lamps burning. It will be Joshua and Zerubbabel. And so those are the two who are in the mind of God as he's communicating this through Zechariah. And so this message is about faith and determination and trust in the power of God. So we see the significance of the message, number one, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. And then the illustration of that, who art thou, O great mountain? If the rubble says so, it'll become a plain. Now, the third one is more a message to the people. In verse 10. Actually, we'll pick up in verse 8 and we'll read this whole context. Moreover, Zechariah 4, 8, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. That sounds a whole lot like the wording used to Joshua in Joshua chapter 6. He says, in, as he opens up Joshua 6, what does he say? See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the kings thereof and the mighty men of valor. Had it happened yet? Not in the beginning of chapter 6. How could God say it had already happened? I have given into your hands. How could He say it like that? He's certain. Can we ever be that certain? I mean, sort of. In James 4, we're told to say what when we're making plans? If the Lord will, we shall go and do, do this and that. So we can never be certain of tomorrow. But God could say, I have given into your hands. God can be certain. And we can be certain as long as it's God's certainty we're resting upon. And and I think that's the point here. So, uh, he says, He shall also finish it, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. Verse 10, here's our statement. For who hath despised... The day of small things. What is that all about? What is the day of small things? Okay, let's go back to Haggai chapter 2 for just a moment. Let's, let's uh, see what, what the scenario is that we're talking about. Go to Haggai chapter 2 and pick up in verse 1. In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory, and how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as what? Nothing. This house can't hold a candle to the glory of the first house. 
When we studied that text in Haggai chapter 2, I took you back to Ezra chapter 3. And do you remember what happened in verses 10 through 12? Everybody shouted when they laid the foundation of the temple. Why did they shout? That's a trick question. Half of them shouted for one reason. There you go. Half of them shouted for joy because they were glad that the, t- that the foundation had been laid. Half of them shouted in mourning because this new temple wasn't as good as the old temple. And it was so significant that you couldn't distinguish the crying from the laughing. You couldn't distinguish the mourning from the joy. So there was a large contingent of people who were saddened by the size of this new temple, by the the nature of it in comparison to the old one. And so Zechariah asked this question in verse 10, Who has despised the day of small things? Now, what an interesting statement. And I found a quote that goes right along with this. And it was talking about how the people had had been overcome with the comparative insignificance of the new tabernacle, the new temple. It was insignificant to them compared to the old one. And here's the quote from this commentator. But when the work is God's work, predetermined and carried out by Him, nothing is inconsequential. Everything has its place. In his plan. Is there such thing as a small job in the kingdom of God? Not really. No job is small if it has to do with God's work. And I think that's one of the lessons that we need to take from this question. Who's despised that they have small things? In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the whole last part of that chapter is all about this. And he uses the illustration of the human body. He says, imagine if the nose and the eyes and the ears started to bicker amongst themselves because the nose couldn't see and the eyes couldn't hear and the ears couldn't smell. How silly would that be? But do we have people who do the same thing? Well, I, uh, you, you get to do this and I don't get to do that. You get all the recognition for doing this and I don't get any recognition. And, and why don't you let me be in charge for once? Why do you always have to be in charge? Or why can't? And you get this bickering and this arguing and this fussing over who gets the recognition and over who gets the most glamorous job and gets to be the one that gets patted on the back. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. And so often we lose sight of that And so we need to remember the day of small things. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, he revisits this and he says, let us be what? Uh, um, Let us be... I've lost the first part of it. Be steadfast, unmovable. There it is. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? For as much as you know your labor is not in vain. You don't work for nothing. Your work doesn't go unnoticed. And I think that's something every one of us needs to understand. Um, So I I, I think that's a really positive thing. Um, So we have a situation here where they were discouraged by the small nature of the work that was being undertaken. But Zechariah says, don't worry about the, the size of the endeavor... Worry about the fact that it's God's work. Continue in verse 10 of Zechariah 4. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet, that is the plumb line, in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. God is a part of this work. This is a good work. And God knows what He's doing. So, we see the significance of this message Number one, it won't be your power, it'll be God's. Number two, Zerubbabel, if you trust me, there's nothing you won't be able to do. And number three, even though this seems like a small situation, God's fingerprints are on it, so it's, it's important. And it's a good work. Any comments or questions about those things? Yeah. 
We still have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. That's right. There's always something to do. Absolutely. Even if the contributions are small, there's still something to do. That's exactly right. And we can always find something to do. Absolutely. Any other comments or questions? <clears throat> so we move to chapter 5, if there's nothing else. And we see the sixth vision, which is of a flying roll. Okay, I don't have a picture of this, but, but don't think like an egg roll. Or any of you ever been to Lambert's? Home of the throwed rolls? Um, don't think of that sort of flying roll. What we're talking about is a scroll that is unfurled, that is unrolled so that you can read what's on the scroll. What they would do is they would uh, unroll the scroll to read it, and then as they read it, they would roll the scroll back up. And so you've got this floating scroll. Okay, that's the picture that, that we need to see. Chapter 5 and verse 1, Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll. And he said unto me, What seest thou? Notice he's still asking him questions. And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof 10 cubits. Now, so we see a scroll that's unrolled so it can be read. We'll notice that in just a moment. Notice its dimensions, 20 by 10. There are two other edifices in the Old Testament that have those same dimensions. There is Solomon's porch in 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 3. It's 20 by 10. And then there is the holy place. Not the most holy place, but the, the first room you enter into. It's also 20 by 10. Now, why is this roll 20 by 10? Is it in reference to those connections? To the, is it to connect it to the temple? I don't know. But those are the only two other things that have those exact dimensions. So it seems pretty coincidental if not. But I don't know. But we have a scroll, and it's 20 cubits by 10 cubits. So, this is a, a decent size roll. Now, what is on that scroll? Keep reading. Verse 3, Then said he unto me, This is the curse that goes forth over the face of the whole earth. For every one that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side, according to it. And every one that sweareth shall be cut off as on that side, according to it. So the scroll is written on both sides. And on one side, it's a curse for those who steal. And on the other side, it's a curse for those who swear. Now the swearing is brought into, into more uh, better focus in verse 4. I'll bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of a thief, and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. And it shall remain in the midst of his house, and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. So... We've got a situation here where the scroll contains two curses. Curses number one, curse number one for those who steal, and curse number two for those who swear falsely by the name of God. Both of those are among the bedrock transgressions of the Old Testament. It's not as if they've messed up some technical sacrifice, some obscure Levitical law. These two are drawn from the Ten Commandments. If you're a Jew and you can't follow the Ten Commandments, you're in trouble. You know, maybe you mess up on some incidental law and you have to repent for that. That's, that's one thing. That's what the priests are for, right? To help you navigate the, 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 the greater law of Moses. But the Ten Commandments? And so I think the point here is very clear. Israel had begun to slack off on some of the most foundational principles of God's law. And so God is reminding Zerubbabel and Joshua, hey look, just because you're back in the land of promise, it doesn't mean you can do whatever you want to. It doesn't mean you can live however you want to live. You've got an obligation to follow me. And you can't neglect these basic foundational truths that I've always expected of my people. And so I think that's, that's what God has in mind here. Exodus 20 and verse 5 is, Thou shalt not steal. That's pretty clear. Okay. And then Exodus 20 and verse 7, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Right? You, should, you don't use it in that way. Swear falsely by the name of God. You don't do those things. Those are 
foundational principles that they had begun, or at least some of them, had begun to neglect. Now, here's what's interesting to me. Where will he go with these curses? Verse 4. Look at verse 4 again. Where will he go with them? Into their houses. Can God see the things we do in our houses? I find that very interesting, right? God says, look, I'm going to take these curses and it's not just going to be out here on the court or in the, in the, in the marketplace or you know, these public places. I'm going to follow you into your home. You know, there's been a big deal every now and then about either the government or internet companies or computer companies, whatever you like, spying on us with our own technological devices. Well, my philosophy on that is if, uh, if, if somebody's assigned to watch my house, they've got one of the most boring jobs because <laughs> we're never there. You know, we're hardly ever home, and they're just sitting there watching the dark living room. I feel bad for the guy or the girl who's sitting there watching our video. Um, but what do we have to hide? You know, what, if, what if people did follow us home? Um, I'll never forget a person who, uh, for, a, you know, a short, for a few months at least, they went to live with a preacher's family. And it was a preacher that she really idolized. And she went to stay with their family. And she said it was the worst thing that ever happened to me relative to my respect for that preacher. Because I saw them in a completely different light. If walls could talk. Now, if walls could talk, that's, that's true. Now, that, that's one reason why I do my best not to try to pretend to be somebody I'm not because I'm preaching every service to people who follow me home. And... Why is it that so often preachers' kids struggle with their own faith? Could it be because they have to follow the preacher home? And sometimes, maybe if we're not careful, the preacher can seem to be somebody in the pulpit that he's not when he goes home. And if the preacher can do that, what about the rest of us? You know, and, and maybe we, we don't behave like we should in our homes but then we put on a completely different persona when we're out in the world. And you and I may never know that. You may never follow me home. But God does. That scroll with the curses written on both sides is going to go into the homes of the thief. It's going to go into the homes of those who swear falsely. And so even if they're doing it inside the privacy of their own four walls, God's going to know it. And I think that's really interesting in the way that it's phrased there in verse 4. And so he's going to enter into the private lives of the people who are committing these, these foundational transgressions and he's going to punish them for their sin. So there's the flying roll, pretty easy to interpret because he tells us pretty much what it means. Anything, any comments or questions about that? Verse 5, we see a seventh vision. And this is the ephah and the woman and the women. <laughs> so we've got an ephah, a woman, and two women. Okay, the woman is not one of the two women. But we're going we're gonna, to uh, at least introduce this. We might be able to get through it here. Verse 5. Then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now thine eyes, and see what it is that goeth forth. And I said, What is it? <laughs> now, thankfully, he doesn't say, What, you don't know what it is? <laughs> he tells him what it is. He gives him a break here. Thankfully, this is an ephah that goeth forth. Now, what is an ephah? Well, an ephah originally was a unit of measurement, of volume. Uh, one commentator said, and I don't know how he came up with this exact measurement, that it's 38.86 American quarts. That's a pretty exact measurement. Uh, I'm going to take his word for it because I'm not a scholar on biblical weights and measures. But the ephah came to mean the basket that will hold such a measurement. Does that make sense? We do that too. Why is it called a bread basket? Because at one point you put bread in it, right? Can you put something else in a bread basket? What if there's a bread basket that's really bigger than bread? Would you still call it a bread basket, even if it's too big to hold 
or if it's you know bigger than just a loaf of bread, you probably would, right? Because it takes that name, right? It, it, you start to name it that, and that's just what it is, even if it's in a different context. If you put your clothes in a bread basket, it's still a bread basket, even if it's got your clothes in it, even if it's twice the size of the original bread basket. Well, that's, that's the etymology that we've got here. The ephah is not a measurement in this context. It's a basket. Now, what... Mm -hmm. Exactly. Do we take it literally? Yeah, do we take that word literally? Yes. That sort of shows us there's no such thing as a word for word translation when you get down to it. And I favor translations that are more literal than thought. Yes. But there really is no such thing. It can't be done. I know that Young has a literal translation. Uh, there's one on my desk called the Modern Literal Translation, and it's a, it's a crowdsourced attempt. It's, at the, it's the New Testament. Now, what it, it's a little herky-jerky, for lack of a better term, because they don't smooth out these types of things and some of the phrasing. Um, if you've ever tried to translate from one language to another, you can't do it literally, right? Sometimes you have to give the sense, right? You've just got to say, well, what it means is this, but, or what it says is this, but what it means is this, right? Now, you've got, as Ken says, you have to be careful. I don't want somebody to tell me what it means in the sense of what's the theological message being given here. That's for me to determine, right? Based on my study of God's Word. Tell me what the words mean in the sense that the words have. That's what I want you to do. So, go ahead. Oh, that, Absolutely. Um, just open up a Bible to Psalm 51 and you'll see whether they're trying to put their own ideas in it or whether they're just translating it. And, uh, but that's a, a discussion for a different time. So this is a bread basket, um, almost literally. But it Yes, exactly, exactly. So this bread basket, though, is big enough to hold a woman. Okay. Now, either it's a very small woman or it's a very big basket. Um, you'll take your pick. Uh, we do understand that this is a vision, right? So whatever it is, this is a vision. So it's not literal. It's, it's representative of something. But let's keep going then. So this is an ephah that goeth forth. He said, moreover, this, this is their resemblance throughout all the earth. Whatever this represents, it represents something throughout the land. Okay? And behold, verse 7, there was lifted up a talon of lead, and this is a woman that sits in the midst of the ephah. So there's a lid... Now, this is hard to say. There's a lid made out of lead, a lead lid. Um, and that lead lid was lifted. And when that lead lid was lifted, there was a lady. <laughs> That's about all I can do. <laughs> That's all I got for you. Um, yeah, sort of like the lady that jumps out. <laughs> okay, yeah, sort of like that. Um, so, <laughs> hopefully better attired, yes. So you've got the, the lead lid that's lifted up, and there's a woman underneath it. And we don't have to guess, though, what this woman is, because verse 8 tells us, and he said, this is wickedness. Okay, wickedness. So the woman represents wickedness, and he cast it into the midst of the ephah, and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof, so he shut up the, the ephah, the basket, and then lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings. Not Bette Midler. Do you recognize that? You were the wind beneath my wings. Uh, for they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heaven, and then said out of the angel that talked with me, Whither do these bear the ephah? And he said unto me, To build it a house in the land of Shinar, and it should be established and set there upon our own base. Now, we don't have time to, to completely unlock all of this, but here's the gist, and then we will unpack it next time we come. Wickedness must be removed from God's people. Shinar is the, the, the birthplace of worldly kingdoms, Genesis chapter 10. The very first earthly kingdom was established in Shinar. And so all of this wickedness is for earthly kingdoms. God's kingdom can't have it in there. And that's the point of this whole vision, and we'll unpack it a little bit more when we come back. Any comments or questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Nimrod. Yes, that's right. Um, 
And in Genesis chapter 10, I think it's 9 and 10. Do I have it up here? No, it's in the next slide. Um, it says this is the beginning of kingdoms. The very first kingdom was established by Nimrod in Genesis chapter 10. And yes, Babel has its own history of wickedness. That's absolutely true. All right. Do what? Yes, Nimrod was the mighty hunter. That's right. All right. Anything else? All right. Thank you, guys.